You boys be quiet down there! Welcome back to PC-98 Paradise, the series where we take a close look at classic games for the NEC PC-98, the most popular Japanese PC series of the early 1990s. I've been making videos for each of the games in the Farland Story series, and at long last we've reached the seventh and final game for the PC-98. This is also the only one that unfortunately never received an English patch along with the others way back in 2003. So what's it about? The subtitle of this one is Juo no Akashi, which is one of those Japanese titles that just doesn't translate very elegantly into English. It means proof of a beast king, meaning that the protagonist of this game is going to have to prove that he is indeed king of the beasts. For this one, longtime character designer Kazue Yamamoto is replaced by Takeshi Kusaka. Kusaka worked as an animation director in TV anime, and not usually as a character designer, but here I think he's done a fine job. So let's open it up. Here's a user support card, and a form for joining TGL's fan club. Here's the manual, which is mostly black and white. Like the other games, there's a small poster. There's an arranged soundtrack CD, and again mine is unopened, so I'll just keep it that way. The game is stored on five floppy disks. The installer is the same as the previous game. After installation, I'll start the game by running fsh.bat. In the last one, the G almost certainly stood for gods, but in this one, the H stands for hell if I know. The opening in this one takes a fairly traditional approach, showing some animation and artwork of a couple of the main characters and some of the bad guys. It will make a lot more sense if you watch it again after playing a bit into the game. Start a new game and a first for the series is the option to change the name of the game's main male and female protagonists. I'll keep the default names. This one takes place in yet another completely different world, never before seen in the series. It says that long, long ago, this world had visitors from Farland, land of the gods. Those gods could take the form of human or beast, and built a peaceful land for humans and beasts to coexist. But there was a mischievous god who thought it would be fun to turn the humans and beasts against each other. When the war finally ended, most of the gods had lost their power and returned to Farland, leaving only one god to rule humans and another to rule the beasts. Interestingly, we play on the side of the beasts. We meet our main character, Van, who like his father can take the form of a lion. Next we meet his friend Paul, who is a fairy, so I guess this is another Farland game with fairies. Sure, why not? Then there's Kale, who not only goes good in a salad, but can turn into a falcon. We begin with these three characters, happily slaying monsters at their usual training grounds. But today they have a rare visitor who has wandered far from home. The first human they've ever met, Princess Elsiana. They remark that she actually doesn't seem all that different from the beasts, at least when they're in their humanoid form. They bring her to the village of the falcons, there, Kale's mother is very kind, but she tells the group that they must bring Elsiana back to the human's land right away. Ever since the war long ago, humans and beasts have lived apart, and humans must not be here in the land of the beasts. On the way to the nearest human city, Van remarks that he doesn't tire easily thanks to his father's strict training. He's always told Van that he needs to be strong enough to protect the land of the beasts, since he's a descendant of the beast god, Narashinha. When Elsiana hears that name, she suddenly becomes hostile. Narashinha is the god who put a curse on her father, the king. She sends Van off of a cliff, and the group goes to help Van rather than spending any more time playing with this meanie. Immediately though, Elsiana is kidnapped. Van rushes to save her. Not only is he not angry, but he's eager to clear up whatever misunderstanding Elsiana may have. Things become even more complicated when royal guards come to find Elsiana. Her cat-like captor quickly abandons the princess and leaves the humans to believe that Van and the beasts are the ones who kidnapped Elsiana. 
The goal of this stage is simply to retreat from the humans as quickly as possible. The humans possess the beast's one true weakness, weapons made from silver. Attempting to attack them will get you nowhere. Elciana is taken back to the castle, and another war between human and beast has begun. And so we have our main plot. The gameplay actually has a number of interesting differences, introduced here this late in the series. I always have the character movement set to fast in these games, but unfortunately that makes the characters move by sliding across the map, which looks kinda silly. In the seventh game, you finally have fast walking animation instead. Also, in this series, whenever you're done moving your characters, you've always had to right click and select end turn, but finally in the seventh one, after moving the last available character, the game goes ahead and asks you if you'd like to end your turn. Wow, Farland story, why was this never a thing until now? Probably the reasoning was that you might still want to use items before the enemy attacks, but even in that case, it works fine to just choose no when prompted to end your turn, so they should have just made it work this way in the first place. Most importantly, all the beast characters in this game can transform into their animal forms at any time. Unlike previous games that had transformations, it doesn't use an entire turn in this one, which makes the transformations infinitely more useful. The characters have different offensive and defensive stats when in their animal forms, and some of them can also move farther. The most useful is Kale's falcon form, which can quickly fly across any terrain or gaps. Each character also has a special ability, as in the previous game, like Van's area attack or Elciana's area heal. Kale has the ability to scan for hidden treasure chests like the goddess in the last game. They've really made the chests hard to find in this one. Maybe it was kind of stupid in previous games how obvious the hidden chests were, but here they've taken things too far in the opposite direction. Look at this spot. There's gotta be something here, right? What? Why did I bother moving Kale all the way over here instead of having everyone fight together? What a waste of time. But unfortunately, finding these chests is one of the only ways to get new items or equipment, cause in this one they've finally done away with the shops, and even money entirely. In my opinion, this isn't much of a loss. The shops would only appear at certain limited points in the games, and you would always end up with way too many items and equipment anyway. So let's get back to the story. After outrunning the humans, Van is attacked by his self-proclaimed arch-rival, Naju, who can turn into a wolf. After dealing with him and tying him to a tree, they go and talk to the Elder of the Beasts, who asks them to bring Naju to him, but he's gone and they think he went to the human village so they go there. This game really has a lot of going back and forth all over the place in order to give the game 40 stages like the previous ones. So it's a good thing they added a map screen to show the party's current location as they move around the world. Without one, it would be really confusing. In the human village, they happen to find some alcohol and there's this funny underage drinking scene with Van and the fairy. The alcohol sends Van on a mystical journey where he has to fight himself. Whoa, what the hell did he drink? Did he eat the fairy? You end up then with an unusable item simply labeled alcohol in your inventory for the rest of the game. And this is the first in the series where there's no alcoholic revival items. Well that was kinda weird, but I'll drink to that. With a 2 liter box of only the finest whiskey in Japan, available only at the most prestigious convenience store. The party tries to go back to Kale's place so Van can rest his drunken head, only to find the Falcon Village under attack by an army of humans. Looks like the war is in full swing. Throughout this war, a number of party members will come and go. There's Skuna, who can turn into a horse, and can also grant an extra turn, like some of the characters in the previous games. In this case, it also restores some HP at the same time, making it way overpowered. There's an elf named Millet who can move quite far in one turn and has a powerful long range attack. A mermaid named Leah who can move through water, if there actually is any on the current map. For a short time there's also a mole with a helmet and a shovel named Mola. Eventually there's even a stage where we check back in with Princess Elciana as she tries to sneak out of the castle. This stage is pretty pointless since she just gets captured at the end even if you manage to get her all the way through. 
Van's self-proclaimed arch-rival Naju will eventually become one of the few party members who sticks around to the very end. But only after a short stint joining up with one of the other antagonist factions I haven't mentioned yet. The Demons. These were the ones truly responsible for Elsiana's kidnapping earlier. Yet they aren't all simply evil. In fact, the party will be joined by a couple of friendly demons named Loin and Tyr. Man, those are some weird names. Loin and Tyr? I guess I'll call him Tyr since the spelling in Japanese is the same as the Norse god. Anyway, Tyr is a vampire who, of course, can turn into a bat. And Loin is a weird guy with a pumpkin on his head with the character class of Jack-O-Lantern. One thing we've got to talk about is the bugs in this game, cause there are quite a few. I noticed more than one instance where the wrong character name was displayed at the top of a text box. The weirdest bug I found is when the vampire, Tyr, sometimes turned into the elf character instead of a bat. This is definitely not supposed to happen, though you may remember in Far Land 3 there was a character who could turn into the other characters. It was funny to have the elf character back in the party at this late stage in the game, but she couldn't attack since I didn't have a usable weapon for her anymore. And this may or may not be a bug, but it's really weird that none of the bosses move in this one. They'll only attack if you're already standing within their attack range. So some of the earlier bosses who don't have long range attacks can literally be killed without taking any damage by using your long range attackers. None of the bugs are game breaking though. In fact, I never even saw this one crash. Most of the earlier games did crash on me occasionally. The sixth one uncontrollably so until I realized there was a patch. No such patch was ever released for the seventh one, so I guess none of these bugs were considered major ones. But enough about bugs. Another thing they got rid of in Far Land 7 is the class change system. In previous games, this changed the appearance of the characters, and we got new attack animations for the second half of the game. But the class changes would reset the characters back to level 1, undoing all their experience. So I'm not too sad to see them gone. But there is one character who sort of gets a new form, without losing his experience. But to talk about it, we're going to have to get into spoilers. As if you couldn't already see it coming, Van turns out to be the reincarnation of the beast god Nara Shinha. Hey, it's Kimba the White Lion. You must avenge my death, Kimba. I mean, Simba. Van now becomes Nara Shinha for some stages of the game. He actually isn't all that strong in this form. I prefer regular Van for his long range attack. Since Van is Nara Shinha, he becomes the target of the Dragon King Fav Niel who was imprisoned and sealed away by Narashinha long ago. Favnil is the main villain for most of the game. He manipulated the humans into the war with the beasts by telling them Narashinha put a curse on their king. Favnil has a human form and, wow, that's exactly what I would have thought an evil dragon would look like as a human. Now that it's become clear that the humans and beasts aren't enemies, Elsiana is back in the party, as well as the guy from the Royal Guard who attacked us earlier, named Galen. Upon defeating Favnil, we learn that even he was merely a tool, being used by the ultimate villain of the game, the demon prince Ugrand, who was posing as one of the king's retainers. He explains that he did it all out of boredom, and he enjoys messing around with mortals for his amusement. If I'm not mistaken, he's supposed to be the same god who started the ancient war between the humans and the beasts. The party fights Ugrand in his true form, but they don't have much luck. It's really slow going, but I definitely would have beaten this given enough time. Before I could though, an event triggered after a certain number of turns. Van laments that Narasinha won't lend him his power for the battle. Then Narasinha is like, what the hell are you talking about? My power has always been in you. The Schwartz is in you, Lone Star. It's in you. All right, I'll try. And so, now Van can suddenly turn into angry Narasinha Van again. Strangely enough, the boss is suddenly vulnerable to everyone's attacks, not just Van's. But whatever, now we can easily take out the end boss. In the ending, Elsiana apologizes to the beasts, since this war was caused by the humans. But Van's father says, no, the war was caused by the animosity which had always existed between human and beast. 
There's no artwork of the characters this time, instead showing what becomes of each of them through the game engine and text. Van decides to live with Elciana in the human world, and for some reason Galen and the mermaid Leah are teased as a couple. It feels a little sloppy that the BGM used for this part is too short and ended long before I finished reading all the text, leaving me to read most of the ending in silence. I mean, I probably read Japanese a little slower than most native speakers, but man, it's definitely way too short. They should have made the music loop, but at least we get another version of the same tune for the credits, along with some cool monochrome drawings of the characters. I like how they divide the music credits in this one into composers and arrangers, so we can see clearly that all the music in this one was composed by Masataka Kitaura, who's been with us since Farland 4. The arrangements are also credited to Kitaura, as well as Takahiro Kaku, who joined in 6. Like the previous game, the music in this one is not the best, but definitely not bad either. As usual, I really enjoy the FM Soundboard 86 arrangements, but you can also judge the MIDI and CD versions for yourself. Well, somebody was having fun with their sampler. Of course, not all the CD arrangements are quite this crazy. It's not that I don't like music, it's just that I don't like music. I don't like music. Hey, now cut that out. This is serious. And normally this is where I would show you ports of the game for other platforms, but like the previous entry in the series, this game is only for PC-98. It was never ported to IBM PCs, even in other parts of Asia, though there is a Korean language patch for the game. And while this may be the last Farland Story game on the 98, there were still other games that used the Farland Story engine. Have you ever thought, sure Farland Story looks kind of fun, but I like my PC-98 games with porn in them? Well, for you, there's Horny Sweeper 1 and 2. TGL was apparently so embarrassed by these, they released them under a new label called Mugen, instead of their usual adult label, Giga. The quality just isn't up to the same standards as Farland Story, but hey, they exist, and they even have English patches, though I've heard they may not be of very good quality or accuracy. And actually, there is one final 8th Farland Story game, but it isn't for PC-98. This was the age when most Japanese PC game developers were leaving the PC-98, so the last Farland Story game was released for Windows. Apparently it combines the characters from Farland 6 and 7, so I'll definitely have to check it out someday. I've had the game just sitting around in my collection for like 20 years. So now let's ask the question that I've asked in all of these Farland Story videos. Is this the best one yet? For me, Farland 6 failed to dethrone 5 as the best one, but then again, I'm biased. Farland 5 is the first one I played on the 98, and the great music, memorable story, and characters makes it a winner for me. The 7th game definitely loses to 5 in the music category, but putting aside my bias, the story and characters are maybe a little more interesting here in 7. The subtle system improvements and added map screen actually go a long way too. 
We can maybe even forgive the bugs, since after all, none are game-breaking. And do you remember my main issue with 5? Many of the stages were just way too long. In 7, it's the opposite. Most of the stages are short, some almost laughably so. And even the longest stages are not nearly as long as the longest ones in previous games, so the entire game actually went by really quickly. This I like, and I think I hear someone saying, how is that a positive thing? If you like the game, wouldn't you want it to be longer? Well, sure, but I don't want to spend over an hour moving my characters around the same boring stage. Short stages means more variety. Okay, that's it, I'm calling it. The seventh one is the best. You may certainly disagree. Each game has its good points. After watching all these videos, what do you think? Which was your favorite? Thanks for watching this episode of PC98 Paradise. It was supported by the folks displayed on your screen. And thanks also to those of you who've stuck around and watched all of these Farland Story videos. I know they don't appeal to everyone, and I'm so glad you came along with me on this journey. Let's play more games together in the future. This is Mr. Jakes, signing off.